Why? What? Well, I don't understand. Can people not reach their backs? I don't think there's a point on my back that I cannot reach. <laughs> like, no, I can reach all the parts of my back. I've never had this problem. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host Simon. Different one today. We're doing a long episode, and what we're doing is I have another show on YouTube, also a podcast called Decoding the Unknown. And one of the things we do on that show is we do this called Fake or Real, where one of the writers tells me stories like in the normal format, but some of them have been made up. Danny is going to do that for today's episode. So uh, some of these are real, some of these are fake. It's called Fake or Real. Creative naming facts, boy. I don't think I came up with that. I think Kevin came up with that. He wrote the uh, original one for the other. He pitched me the idea originally. I was like, that sounds like a good idea. And people like them. I like them. It's fun. Let's go. Play along with me, okay? Okay, let's go. Today, I want to talk to you about a problem we all face in our lives online. I mean, picture this. You're browsing the internet. You're just minding your own business. And suddenly... Your location messes up your plans. It's frustrating, right? But guess what? We found the perfect solution to this problem, and it's called Surfshark VPN, today's wonderful sponsor. Now, I know what you're thinking. VPNs can be complicated, right? Well, not with Surfshark. Oh, no, it's incredibly easy to use with just a few clicks. You can protect all of your internet devices and stay private online. With Surfshark, protect yourself while browsing, streaming, or even traveling. Yes, your location will never mess up your plans again. Imagine being able to access content from back home. Wherever you go, it's like virtually traveling the world with one click. Plus, with Surfshark, you can easily connect to popular websites like Amazon and AliExpress, even if they're blocked in your country. No more missing out on amazing deals. Surfshark offers amazing features to enhance your online security. They have over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, so you'll always find one that suits your needs. And their military-grade encryption ensures that all your data remains private and secure. And get this, with one Surfshark subscription, you can protect unlimited devices, share it with your friends, and pay less than a piece of gum for more secure and private online activity. It's an incredible deal. And here's the best part. Right now, you can get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash blaze. And if you enter the promo code blaze, you'll get 83% off and three extra months for free. It's an exclusive offer just for you. So don't miss out. And now back to today's video. Buckingham Palace and the White House must both absolutely reek of weed. I imagine that wasn't like Bill Clinton, wasn't he? Well, like, I once, I, I smoked weed. And it's like, yeah, Bill, look at you. We know. Like, Bill Clinton looks like the type. He's somehow he's president. Somehow he looks like the president. But he also looks like a guy who'd smoke loads of weed, right? If you believe everything you read in the press, every famous person to have received a prestigious in invitation to either of these establishments has ended up either necking a load of drugs whilst on the premises or stealing a souvenir. They're like the capital drug dens of the UK and US, catering largely for celebrity thieves. <laughs> I feel like doing stealing something from Buckingham Palace is like it's probably a bigger you know you're gonna get in trouble for that. I bet the police will arrest you. It's like you're yeah, legend. <laughs> nice one. And then they'll let you go. And then the queen, oh the king, will be like actually I want to prosecute. And it'll be me versus you. It's actually you versus the king in all the cases, like criminal cases. It's you versus Regina. Has Regina changed? Because it's always like you know it'll be like Whistler and R, which stands for Regina. Is that different now? There's a king. I'm very curious about that. Not curious enough to go and look it up, but curious enough to, to comment on it. It's also interesting that Regina kind of sounds like vagina. Nice. I remember studying law and it'd be like, ah, Regina. <laughs> ah! God, I'm a child, and I always have been. A surprisingly long list of high-profile names, including Cockwomble, Piers Morgan. Yeah, Piers Morgan's a bit of a bell end, isn't he? Claims to have stolen roll a toilet roll from Buckingham Palace. Oh, you naughty boy, Piers. You naughty boy. I never paid for toilet roll while I, while I was at university. I'd always just steal it. Like, whenever I took a sh on campus, I'd just be, there'd always be a spare toilet roll, like, ready to load into that thing. I'd just shove that in my backpack and take it home. <laughs> I mean, allegedly. <laughs> MI6 Whilst the likes of Stephen Fry and Robbie Williams claim to have taken drugs during their visit, meanwhile Snoop Dogg claims to have smoked a blunt while visiting the restroom in the White House and country legend Willie- Yeah, it's like Snoop Dogg, of course he did. If he's there for more than 20 minutes, he's gotta smoke. I feel like Snoop Dogg's the sort of guy who wakes up in the night, he'll set an alarm for like 4am, being like, I can't sleep if I'm not high. <laughs> hey, Snoop! 
A country legend, Willie Nelson, quite bizarrely claims that he climbed up onto the White House roof to enjoy his joint in peace, as all the restrooms were presumably already packed full of all the, all the other guests quietly enjoying a toke on that day. But perhaps one of the most famous stories of all involves the time that all four meters of the members of the Beatles decided to light up the jazz cabbage in Buckingham Palace in 1965. The Fab Four had each been honored with an MBE, most member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, and had rocked up to the palace to pick up their special gong from the Queen. It was considered a controversial decision at the time, and it was an honor that arrived surprisingly early on in the groundbreaking career of the Liverpudlian mob tops. The feeling from some quarters at the time was that MBs were supposed to be reserved for colonels and politicians and posh rich people. <laughs> That's changed. It's nice. Nowadays, they, they give these to people who actually, you know, deserve them, rather than just be like, oh, you did something for the government for a while or in the military and you had, you know, here you go. <laughs> I didn't do fucking shit. And now it's like they give them to like sports people and, you know, charity workers and stuff like that. It's cool. I like that that's changed rather than just being something reserved for like posh rich people. Now it's like, you know, if you do some cool shit for England, James. <laughs> I love that clip. For England, James. No, for me. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond would have an MBE. He'd have a KB. It'd be Sir James, wouldn't it? Why well, wouldn't? Because he's a spy, so no one knows where he is. Just Dan. I feel like Sir. Is it Sir Daniel? Daniel Craig? He's on his. He's on his way. The very idea of dishing them out to four Northerners in a silly pop band was seen as a dilution of the brand. When a bunch of MBE military veterans publicly expressed their distaste at the decision, John Lennon retorted, "They got them for killing people. We got ours for entertaining. I'd say we deserve ours more." Now, look, John Lennon, bit of a famous bellend, isn't he? But he's bang on with that one, isn't he? Although, I mean, look, if you're off killing enemies of England. Fine. Like, I don't really like war. But if you're being a terrorist somewhere, I mean, well, hey, don't be a terrorist. John Lennon was also, <laughs> people were like, I'm not a terrorist, I'm a freedom fighter. It's like, okay, okay, <laughs> sure, yeah, freedom. <laughs> John Lennon was also the one who claimed that after the band first arrived at Buckingham Palace for a date with the Queen, they became so nervous by the prospect of it all that they nipped into the palace toilets and lit up a joint to calm their nerves. It's a story which became widely accepted over the years to follow, and it wouldn't have been entirely implausible, as Lennon had also admitted that all four members of the band were pretty much smoking weed for breakfast at the time. However, the other three Beatles eventually nipped the rumors in the bud. Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr have explained that they just smoked regular cigarettes in the toilet and would never have dreamed of turning up to Buckingham palace carrying weed <laughs> they're like yeah 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 john allegedly mate allegedly john for god's sake allegedly lennon was just fibbing maybe it's not out of the question that the other three felt a fresh inclination to pretend it never happens they may have wanted to avoid offending the queen as they would later be eyeing up potential knighthoods lennon burned his bridges on that front after returning his mbe just one year later in protest at the uk's involvement in the nigerian civil war in 1966 but why well, good for you, John Lennon. People turn these down out of protest. Like Stephen Hawking turned down a knighthood. I can't remember quite why. But it's usually, it's, it's a big thing. Like when you turn it down, that's probably going to get more press than you just getting knighted. Because you'd be like, that's a big deal that you turn that down. And be like, oh, I don't want to turn it down. I'd be, sir, that's pretty tight. Paul would go on to become a sir in 1997, while Wingo, Ringo would have to wait until 2018 for his knighthood. He had to wait 20 more years. Who knows? <laughs> F I mean, Ringo Starr's not Paul McCartney, is he? Let's just put it like that. Poor old George never got one, although he turned down an OBE in 2000 as he found the lower status to be an insult after Paul had already been knighted three years earlier. Yeah, that's legit, because the OBE is the bottom one, right? There's OBE, MBE, KBE, and KBE is the knighted. And I mean, there is, it's, they're all big honors. Like, most people don't get these. <laughs> Most people don't get these. I guess you'd just be like, yeah, okay, fine. Because <laughs> you're like, you're not you're not as big a deal as um, who got his pool. But like, that's really like, that's two rungs down. <laughs> but in all likelihood, the Beatles never really smoked weed in Buckingham Palace. Much like the other stories involving Snoop Dogg, Willie Nelson, and prize plonker Piers Morgan, it's probably more of a case of celebrities attempting to sound super cool by pretending that they did something a bit naughty in a place you'd expect to behave. Incidentally, there would be no value in stealing toilet roll from Buckingham Palace. It's just regular white toilet roll. It's not like guests are invited to wipe their bits on gold-leafed toilet roll imprinted with the smiling face of the king. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool, though, isn't it? Maybe Charles can change that, old Charlie. Be like, yeah, 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 we're using some of the, the Buckingham budget to get some, like, embossed with his face. So you're, like, wiping your chocolate on his face. <laughs> In his house. 
Of course, it's perfectly reasonable to accept that fast-living, hell-raising celebrities with fabulous wealth probably have more than their fair share of interesting anecdotes to share at the dinner table, but even so, many of the stories that get printed in the press turn out to be little more than urban myth. I would have loved to believe that Charlie Chaplin once spontaneously entered a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest at a traveling fair in 1920, but only came 27th out of 40 competitors. Apparently, this was largely because he wasn't wearing his signature moustache and costume, so it looked as if he hadn't been asked to make much effort. However, Chaplin himself never mentioned this. There's no record of the traveling fair in the st- Danny, mate, is this still the introduction? Are we going to get into the game? It's eight minutes in and I want to play the game, Danny. What the f*** is going on? Daddy, chill. And the story circulating in the press appeared to have been passed on from someone who heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else without any concrete original source. Whilst we're at it, Michael Jackson, whilst we're at it, Danny, how about we get into the game? Daddy, chill. Michael Jackson never owned the remains of the Elephant Man. Halle Berry doesn't have 12 toes. (laughs) What? American children's TV host Mr. Rogers was never a Marine Scout sniper with 150 kills under his belt, and Simon Whistler doesn't run a secret shelter for emotionally troubled dogs in the North Pole. Yeah, according to you, Danny, how do you know? You don't know what I get up to on the weekends, but that doesn't mean that other surprising outlandish and downright outrageous stories relating to famous people aren't completely true. And it's been a couple of years since we ran a last fake or real quiz on Brainblaze. Wait, we did it here first. Okay. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you something. We don't care. I figured this would be a good opportunity to revive the format with a new epic game blaze, which asks you to identify which of the following world celebrity facts are true and which ones I've just completely made up for shits and giggles. Okay, Daddy, so we're finally getting there, are we? Ten minutes in, Daddy. Thanks, Daddy. Love it. Love it. This is really good for my retention. Everyone's still watching, Daddy. Everyone's here for a ten-minute introduction, Danny. Yes. All the answers will be revealed right at the end of the video, so don't forget to keep a tally of your score to be in with a chance of winning absolutely f***ing nothing. Ah. Our main contestant this week is Simon Whistler, who now tells us a little bit about his unusual hobbies in 30 seconds as we prepare to get the quiz underway. I don't have any hobbies, Danny. <laughs> I've tried to have hobbies. I desperately have. I bought a road bike. I tried to do that. I tried to get my pilot's license. The problem is, I have a job which is quite demanding and i have two young children which is also quite demanding and at the same time i mean i'm not personally renovating a house but i'm trying to like organize like when <laughs> me and my wife like sit down for dinner it's like you want to catch up on what we've been up to lately it's like yeah but we have to decide about things for a kitchen and i'm like oh, for fuck's sake I do not have time for hobbies except my dog shelter at the north pole will smith once got an accidental tattoo of margaret thatcher no he fucking didn't I don't believe this already. Although it's hard these days not to mention Will Smith without mentioning the famous slapping incident at the 2022 Academy Awards, it's a wonder that he didn't give his tattoo artist an even bigger slap after seeing what he'd done to the back of poor Will's right leg. Back in 2002, Will walked into the Secret Ink Tattoo Studio in Calabasas, Los Angeles, with a view to getting a relatively small tattoo of a vintage mo- a vintage movie idol, Marilyn Monroe, inked on his upper right leg. What he walked out with was indisputably the face of Margaret Thatcher, the highly divisive UK Prime Minister, who served between 1979 and 1990. Not that either the tattoo artist or Will Smith himself would ever admit to such a thing. Most people would agree that we're not just talking about a vague passing resemblance to Thatcher here. What Will Smith had requested was a black and white stencil-like rendering of Marilyn Monroe's head and shoulders in a seductively mean and moody pose. (laughs) There's not a lot of similarities between Margaret Thatcher and Marilyn Monroe. The tattoo artist Martin Hildebrandt got the shoulders and the mean and moody angle spot on. The problem was that perched right on top of Marilyn Monroe's shoulders was the unmistakable face of a mean and moody Margaret Thatcher. And Sam, if this is real, don't be showing images of this right now, because that'll spoil the game and give everyone an unfair advantage over me who can't see them. And I don't mean that it was a shoddy tattoo, I mean that the face looked absolutely nothing like Marilyn Monroe, yet looked almost identical to a portrait of Margaret Thatcher, which was first commissioned in 1984 and still hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in London today, right down to the eyes, the nose, and the slightly wrinkled frown of disapproval which was probably directed at the striking miners of Britain. (laughs) As they deserved, Danny! The resemblance is more than uncanny. It's as if Martin Hildebrandt was using the very same portrait of Thatcher as the reference material for Will Smith's tattoo. It's not as if the tattoo came cheap either. The Secret Ink tattoo in Calabasas charges around $2,000 an hour. Are you in? Ins- what the f, man? Tattoo artists can earn $2,000 an hour? Holy sh! I got into the wrong career. And there's usually a three month waiting list for clients, so they're always busy. That's some, there's some dude in there doing tattoos all day every day for two grand an hour? F***ing hell. And all he can do is Margaret Thatcher. 
Jesus. Although it's speculated that Will Smith managed to jump the queue, just to clarify the question we're asking in this opening segment, I'm not necessarily trying to suggest that the tattoo artist either purposefully or accidentally inked an image of Margaret Thatcher onto Will Smith's leg. Neither Martin Hildebrandt nor Will Smith have discussed it very often, although both of them have quite sniffily insisted that it's definitely a tattoo of Marilyn Monroe. But I'm asking if it's true or false that Will Smith has a tattoo on his back leg, which at least 90% of people clearly identify as Margaret Thatcher, particularly when compared side by side with the 1984 portrait of Thatcher in the National Portrait Gallery. No f***ing chance, I don't believe it. Someone who's charging $2,000 an hour is not that incompetent. Um, and I just don't think this happens. We haven't actually seen it out in the wild very often. Will Smith had it on show during a photo shoot in 2003, which is when the unfavorable comments began first flooding in, but he's been a little shy about getting it out ever since then. During an interview with Ellen DeGeneres in 2009, he was dared by the host to show it, show it to the audience, but he brushed off the idea with a laugh as he explained that he hadn't, been come, hadn't come prepared to drop his trousers on television. I'll tell you what, Will, there's another way you could do it. You could just roll up your pant leg, can't you, Will? Can't you, Will? You just didn't want to, sh- didn't want to show it, Will. What, are you embarrassed about your Margaret Thatcher tattoo? Are you worried that the miners of Britain are going to take umbrage with you, Will? They will, Will. They will come for you. No, I'm just joking. They're all dead from black lung. You get... What? You do get to see just a tiny glimpse of it in a long shot in the sequence from a 2006 film, The Pursuit of Happiness, but you can only really tell when you're looking at heavily zoomed in images pulled from this sequence rather than when you're just casually watching the movie. Curiously, a sequence depicting the back of Will Smith's right leg in the 2020 movie Bad Boys for Life shows they made a new Bad Boys movie? (laughs) Really? I loved Bad Boys when I was a kid. I just didn't know they made a new one. Although I haven't really seen, like, I haven't seen many movies since 2019 because that's when my first kid was born. And just like go to the movies is like not something I've really done in a while. I've seen like a couple of movies. But that's about it. The last movie I remember seeing, like before kids really kicked off, was The Gentleman, that um, Guy Ritchie movie, which was fucking fantastic. But it's not clear if Will has recently had the tattoo removed or it was just airbrushed out of the film. We'd like to think that Will Smith popped back to the Secret Ink Tattoo Studio for a minor improvement to the design, but ended up walking out with a tattoo of Boris Johnson. I don't believe it. I, Danny went into some specific details, which makes me think that maybe it did happen, but also sometimes when you get too specific with the details, that means it's made up. So I'm going to say no, it didn't happen. I'm also going to get a little notepad so I can write down what's happening. This is how well equipped my office is. I have a little pack of matches that came from one of our sponsors, Sheath. And I have a pencil which is in desperate need of sharpening from a company called Tutor, which my wife worked for like 10 years ago. So this pencil is uh, well used. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Will Smith, this pencil doesn't work at all. Oh, for God's sake, no. Okay. Buzz Lightyear escaped a life sentence by snitching on his mates. Oh, I feel like I know this one. Tim Allen. Um, oh no, spoiler alert, I know this story and it's true. Tim Allen and his cocaine smuggling, this is famous. Danny, this is too well known. Uh, I, w- I won't pretend and we'll just have to write this one off as zero points for you, zero points for me. And I spoiled it for the audience, you're welcome. For many, American comedian and actor Tim Allen will forever be known as the voice of Buzz Lightyear from the Toy Story movies. For others, he may be more associated with the long-running 90s hit sitcom Home Improvement. I loved that show when I was a kid. I watched that every day. It was on like the Disney Channel or something from like 9 to 9.30 every night and I always watched it. Or more recent Last Man Standing, which came to a close in 2021. I've never heard of that. I don't know that. Maybe I'll check that out. For me, I don't think he'll ever beat his finest cinematic hours in the Santa Claus franchise, but Tim Allen may have been remembered for none of those things if he hadn't managed to escape a life sentence for dealing cocaine in 1978 by snitching on a long list of other dealers. Oh, I thought he was smuggling cocaine. My bad. After graduating from college, Tim Allen, real name Tim Dick, the poor lamb. <laughs> Should have called him Richard. Richard Dick. Dick Dick! Our daddy taught us not to be ashamed of our dicks, especially since they're such good size and all. What? Picked up a fairly respectable job in the marketing department of a sports good company. This was the inspiration for his latest sitcom, Last Man Standing, but it's interesting to note that Tim never bothered to develop a sitcom based on the enterprise he ran on the side while he was raking, which was raking considerably more money than his day job. Probably something he doesn't really want to revisit, is it, Danny? <laughs> He's like, yeah, remember that time I always went to prison for life? Let's make a story about that and remind all the people that I snitched on so now they come and murder me. Tim was living something of a double life. By day, he was an ordinary Joe in a marketing department. By night, he was a one be drug dealing kingpin who was pulling in a stack of money from shifting cocaine. <laughs> During this would be a good TV show, though. I'm sure this TV show actually already exists. During one particularly lucrative deal in 1978, a 23-year-old Mr. Dick trotted along Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport. Trotted along to Kalamazoo. <laughs> 
Kalamazoo Battle Creek is a real name of a place, America? <laughs> okay. In Michigan, with an Adidas bag, or if you're American and you prefer it, Adidas, uh, containing well over half a kilo of Coke. His, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of cocaine. <laughs> His plan was to drop off that Adidas bag in a locker and then meet up with the client as were in the airport and exchange the locker key for a cool $42,000. That's some really cheap cocaine. Wait, a half a, that's 500 grams of cocaine, 150 pounds a gram? Jesus, that's a good deal. During his earlier talks with his client, Tim had suggested the location and the method of transaction himself simply because he had seen this kind of thing in movies and thought it looked cool. As the real-life scene played out, Tim indeed dropped the bag of cocaine in the locker, but instead of receiving $42,000, he was immediately handcuffed and swarmed by police, pointing guns in his face. The whole deal had been a sting operation set up by an undercover police officer who had been on to Mr. Dick's trail for some time. Tim Allen couldn't have picked a worse time to get arrested for dealing cocaine in Michigan. In that very same year, the state had just introduced one of the strictest new drug laws ever seen in the country known as the 650 lifer law anyone found guilty of selling 650 grams or more of heroin or cocaine would be automatically given a life sentence with no parole jesus christ what the is wrong with you america that's insane no parole no forgiveness it's not a violent crime he's just selling coke but didn't he have half a kilo so he's under that tim allen had been caught exactly with 650 grams of cocaine okay never mind what are you doing tim just have 649 grams tim are you insane if you're gonna do if there's like a law that says yo 650 grams or more life without parole then you may as well just do fucking tons just do tons of cocaine or 649 grams there should be no in-between. Although he pled guilty to drug trafficking, he would ultimately be sentenced to only five years in prison after striking a deal with government agents and agreeing to provide names of other drug dealers. Jail, right away. This allowed him to face trial in federal court rather than a state court and bypass Michigan's pretty harsh life sentence policy. Tim sang like a canary and reeled out no less than 21 names. I imagine that whilst those people may have initially felt a bit miffed at Tim Allen, I'm sure they had a good laugh later on whatever episode of Home Improvement popped up on the prison TV to remind them how they ended up with life sentences. <laughs> oh my god, that has got to... There's 21 people who cannot hate you more. Like, they're all sitting in prison with life sentences, and you're a rich TV star slash movie star. That sucks, bro. <laughs> and I'm sure they would have felt some degree of pride in the knowledge that they played a small part in helping to launch the career of Tim Allen. After all, if he'd been stuck in prison for the rest of his life, he wouldn't have been able to pull in a million dollars an episode. <laughs> ah! For the later seasons of Home Improvement, and he wouldn't have had a net worth of a hundred million dollars today. While these other fucks are sitting in prison. <laughs> That's brutal. Tim only, and I, I like that I know this one's true because it's just so brutal. Tim himself only served two and a half years in prison before he was paroled in 1981. The sentencing judge had told him that he expected him to be a very successful comedian and had, to be, and had been considerate enough to send him about 600 miles away to prison in Sandstone, Minnesota, as it was felt that he might be subject to regular rigorous retribution in the prison yard of a local Michigan facility. Yeah, no Yep, right. Tim Allen would have been drawing the showers. And of course, following his release, Tim Allen turned his life around and embarked upon a career which stretched to infinity and beyond. Ah! I reckon that he's gone on to make almost as much money as he would have if he'd made it, if he'd stuck with the cocaine dealing. He's got more. He's got more. Christopher Walken used to be a lion tamer in a circus. Really? Don't know this one, whether it's true or fake. I may have had a few unusual jobs in my time, but I can't say that I've ever tried my hand at becoming a lion taper. To be fair, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken, he's the guy... I, I know his face, right? He's Detective whatever his name is from American Psycho. And a uh, whole lot of others where he had bigger roles. I don't know. He wasn't exactly a fully-fledged lion tamer either. He was more of a kind of apprentice lion tamer. Only got to play with the one friendly lion. The oddball actor and surprisingly nifty dancer didn't know that really hit the big time when he won an academy award for the acclaimed role for his acclaimed role in the deer hunter in 1978 holy shit, academy awards a big deal i've not seen the deer hunter i guess it's about hunting deer back in <laughs> people people watching this who've seen the deer hunter be like oh simon you didn't know that it was a coming of age movie about xyz <laughs> but in fact his mother had been pushing a young christopher or ronnie naturally that's what you'd go for what's your name christopher yeah but you could call me ron Okay. In front of the cameras, ever since he was a kid in the 1950s, he and his brothers, all raised in Astoria, Queens, New York, often appeared as child extras in TV shows, with one of Christopher's most notable early appearances taking place on the Colgate Comedy Hour, where he got to perform a brief skit with Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. Holy shit, okay. 
<laughs> I've heard of those guys. But by the time he hit the age, by the but by the but, what is wrong with my voice? But by the time he hit the age of sixteen, Christopher was growing too old to be a cute child extra, and so he found himself looking for a seasonal job in the trade paper. And that's when he came across a vacancy for assistant lion tamer in a travelling circus. I might have been tempted by this myself, but I never saw such a vacancy in the Rotherham Witch Finder. But you can certainly see the attraction. Warehouse operator? No, road sweeper. No, thank you, elevator designer. Not for me, assistant lion tamer. Count me the. F it's often claimed that Christopher ran away from home to join the circus, but the actor himself has clarified that it wasn't as dramatic as that. He says, I didn't run away, I just got a job as a trainee lion tamer. Who's gonna turn that down? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, that sounds dangerous and underpaid. <laughs> the actual act involved head tamer Terrell Jacobs doing the heavy lifting with the grumpier lions who would all have left the ring by the time Christopher made his entrance. The idea was that Christopher would pretend to be Terrell's young son and apprentice, and he would come on right at the end to perform a few tricks with an old friendly lioness by the name of Sheba. I believe this. I think this is true. I think this is reasonable. Like, I don't know if I'd have believed the Tim Allen one if I didn't know it already. Um, but I, I believe this. It seems just reasonable enough to be true. And I look at Christopher Walken. I'm like, yeah, I think that guy could do that. I think he's done that. Look at his face. He's seen sh uh, this lion behaved more like a sleepy dog as Christopher waved his whip. Sheba would sit up and run about and roll all over. So it's not as if the future actor was risking his life and limb by shoving his head in the mouth of a lion, performing under the name of Ferocious Fernando the Slightly Temperamental. He was more likely to get licked to death by Sheba. Yeah, but this is one of those things, right, where people, isn't that there's like lots of stories of people who keep lions and tigers in their houses in Florida, probably. And it's like, yeah, no, oh, she's so gentle. She's so, she was so gentle for 20 years just a beautiful tiger and then one day she ate my grandchildren and it's because they f***ing snap they're, they're wild animals they can just go absolutely mental at a moment's notice so i'll be like no i don't care how friendly sheba is and how licky she is because one time she's gonna f***ing eat my neck and then i'm not gonna have a neck and i need that it's what my head's attached to or what my body's attached to my head But it's still an odd job, odd job to have listed on your CV. He didn't say stay with the lions for very long, referring it to actors have CVs. I don't think so. No, you just have reels, right? And acting credits. It's not I was a lion tamer and then I did a summer work in Sainsbury's. It's like, no, you're just like, I was in this, I was in that, and I'm going to audition. Boom. Preferring instead to move out of the circus ring and into the arenas of dance, theatre, and theatre before becoming one of the coolest cats on the cinema screen, Michelle Pfeiffer once got mixed up. Oh, wait, this is a new entry, sorry. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, Michelle Pfeiffer makes an entrance. And she does in this next entry. She once got mixed up with a lethal cult. I believe this already. I'm like, yeah, I don't really know Michelle Pfeiffer. She, Pfeiffer, she was a bit before my time. I, uh, I remember, wasn't she on The Simpsons? She played, like, some sexy woman on the simpsons at some point and that's when i was that actually michelle pfeiffer as michelle pfeiffer or was it just michelle pfeiffer playing someone else i feel like she was on the simpsons that was the first experience that i had of michelle pfeiffer i don't really know what else she's done let's find out it's always nice to feel part of a gang <laughs> Unless that gang is like MS-14 or whatever, then you're like, oh no, it's not nice to be in a gang. <laughs> it's fucking scary. <sighs> but you need to be careful about who exactly you're hanging out with. I can remember the sad day that I got kicked out of the local crime-busting BMX kids gang, partly because my mum thought the other kids were a bad influence and partly because I didn't even have a BMX. But if you're thinking of going, <laughs> it reminds me of the... Uh... What's that? Uh, is it Mitchell and Webb? And there's like Soul Savior, a BMX bandit or whatever. And there's the one guy. This isn't funny if you've not seen it because I'm really telling a bad story about this like comedy sketch. But just look up BMX bandit Mitchell and Webb and you'll, you'll have a good time. <laughs> not right now. Finish watching this video, of course. Don't be an idiot and leave me now. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing promoting other videos that people should watch on YouTube while you're in the middle of a YouTube video? Do you know nothing about YouTube Fact Boy? Come on. Have you learned nothing? But if you're thinking of going a step further and signing on the dotted line with a weird cult, I would strongly recommend that you avoid having anything to do with the breath, re, be, bre, breatharian, breatharian cults. Partly because it's very silly. I know breatharians are real. 
They're the people who think that you can live off like air and shit. And partly because you're likely to end up dead very quickly if you follow the group guidelines. Breatharianism is the perceived ability to reach a higher level of consciousness in which you can give up food and even water and subsist entirely on good old fashioned fresh air and sunlight. On the plus side, you'll save a fortune on grocery shopping and cutting out cooking and dining will free up more time to consider what other weird cults you fancy joining in the coming months. Spoiler alert, you'll fing die. On the downside, you probably won't have much time left to weigh up the options as you'll end up dead from dehydration or starvation. And this was the risk facing Michelle Pfeiffer when she first left home and landed in Hollywood at the age of 20, still just a few years. I totally believe this. It sounds like exactly the sort of thing. Like, pretty young Michelle Pfeiffer arrives in Hollywood, like, lost and looking for jobs, and she ends up joining a cult. It feels like. Ex Although maybe it's too obvious. But it's Michelle Pfeiffer. Why would Danny pick Michelle Pfeiffer? I believe this. Still just a few years away from making the big time, picking up her first Academy Award nominations and becoming one of the highest paid actresses of both the 80s and 90s, it's not like she moved into a commune or anything like that. Michelle bumped into a couple who sold themselves as personal trainers, working with weights and dire control. I am realizing that I might think this is real because I might know this story. This is feeling a little bit familiar. This is beginning to feel familiar. Like I know we, I, I've definitely made videos about people joining cults and stuff. I feel like I know this one. I feel like old Michelle. I feel I'm not I don't know it well enough to say a hundred percent that I know it's real. But I'm pretty sure I know it's real. And now I hear about these personal trainers. This is like making bells go off in my mind that I know this. That I know this, that I've done this before. Someone will be like, Simon, you made a bit a whole video about Michelle Pfeiffer's cult. <laughs> Jesus, you stupid. <laughs> Michelle began to visit them three times a week. This is real. I feel I definitely know this. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. And they were constantly badgering her to visit even more frequently while asking for more and more money in return for their expertise. She was initially placed on a fruitarianism diet, but then discovered that the ultimate goal was for Michelle to become a full-fledged follower of breatharianism, also known as Enida, which is Latin for fasting. The couple reckoned that every human being was supposed to live on the natural nutrients found in air and light. There's no f***ing nutrients found in air and light. <laughs> what are you talking about? As time went on, the couple tried to control every aspect of Michelle's life as they gradually drained her dwindling bank account and placed her on increasingly unfeasible and downright dangerous diets. When Michelle tried to sever ties with the couple, they persuaded her to keep going on the grounds that she wouldn't be able to survive without them. <laughs> so that you won't be able to survive with them, Michelle. Michelle had unwittingly found herself in the grip of a mad cult. Although she never revealed the identity of the couple, it's possible that one of them may have been a New York guy by the name of Wiley Brooks, who had worked as a sound engineer for Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix before evolving into the Godfather father of modern breatharianism. He certainly didn't invent the concept, which has its roots in religious transcendental meditation, but he was the only widely known practitioner of breatharianism at the time. All of the others were dead. <laughs> and he's secretly snacking on, like, Fig Newtons or something, isn't he? He would go on to charge $500 a pop for intensive five-day seminars in which he would come out with such nuggets of wisdom as food is more addictive than heroin. Well, yeah, obviously, but it's not addictive. You f***ing need it to survive. <laughs> Same could be said about heroin. <laughs> All that changed in the mid-80s when his credibility as a breatharian was shattered after he was spotted sneaking out of a corner shop with a bag overflowing with junk food. Ah, busted. He's like, no, 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 I just chew it and spit it out. Michelle Viver thankfully escaped the clutches of the cult, held along, helped along by her future husband, Peter Horton, who was researching for a role in an upcoming movie about the Moonies, the brainwashed followers of another nutty cult, which today is still going strong under the name of Unification Church. Oh, Danny, I know this one as well. This is all becoming so familiar. I know this. I know this is true. And so we've got to give it another zero for me and a zero for you. It's like, as I'm telling this story, I like the boyfriends and the Moonies. I know this. I know this is true. Michelle was helping out Peter with the research, which involved interviewing former Moonies about their time in the cult. As one of the interviewees talked at length about the psychological manipulation involved, Michelle experienced a sudden epiphany of her own as she realized that she herself had been drawn into a dangerous cult and she needed to get out fast. I'm begging for help. I'm screaming for help. Please come let me out. Today, she's back on the more traditional kind of healthy diet, which involves the f***ing consumption of food and water. As for Wiley Brooks, shortly before his death in 2016, he claimed to have passed into a higher dimension, yet was convinced that his every move was being monitored by the Illuminati. Wiley Brooks, it sounds like there was something wrong with you all along, mate, doesn't it? They were probably just mucking about and trying to get another picture of him popping, into his, popping his head into a dirty KFC bucket. Danny, there's nothing dirty about a bucket of KFC. The only thing that a KFC bucket has is joy inside. Tom Hardy his first TV appearance was excruciating. Okay, so what did we have? Bruce, uh, Bruce Willis. Will Smith. I just saw Willis. 
because I wrote Will S. And then I thought Bruce Willis, no. And then we had the zero one. And then we had... Oh, I've forgotten. I've forgotten. Hopefully we'll remember it all at the end. You keep track at home. A 2022 episode of Graham Norton's long-running BBC chat show recently ran into a spot of trouble during rehearsals for an episode in which the Iris presenter was chatting and cracking jokes with Sir Lenny Hendry, rapper Stormzy, and uh, uh, excuse me, and British actor Tom Hardy. The Graham Norton Show is one of those chat shows where the host appears to randomly throw occasional surprises at the celebrity guests. <laughs> I'd hate that. <laughs> Be like, hey, look, we found this. Tom, look, it's you being sh** acting. Tommy, like, oh, I thought this was buried. And you, and it'd be just like, hey, hey, yeah, look, it's just I can laugh at myself. <laughs> Graham, why? You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. Molded by it. For example, he might roll potentially embarrassing footage of a very early TV appearance, leading the guests to shriek in horror at how they look very slightly different than when they were a bit younger. Of course, the whole thing is meticulously rehearsed beforehand, and the guests said, Is it really? And the guests, that's disappointing. Is it really? That it's, then it's not a surprise. I guess that's why you have actors on, isn't it? <laughs> when when you have a non actor? Like, I don't know who the fuck Stormzy is, but she's probably not an actor. Didn't he say she was a singer or something? Um, rapper? Something like that? Stormzy sounds like a rapper. People are going to be like, Oh, Simon, you don't know. I don't know. Stormzy. Why would I know Stormzy? I'm 36 years old. And then, but the problem is, like, Tom. What was it? Which Tom are we talking about? Tom Hardy. He can act. So he can, like, when, when it's thrown him as a surprise, he can be like, oh, no, you didn't. You really found that. Oh, you didn't. He can kind of be good at it. Whereas Stormzy will be like, oh, no. <laughs> Look what you found. This is such a surprise. <laughs> But one particular surprise thrown at Tom Hardy during rehearsals didn't make it into the actual broadcast. Tom Hardy, oh, he was like, no, you fucking don't. I'll take you down, Graham. Tom Hardy was recently voted by Americans as the hardest actor to understand. I can never work out if the actor's natural accent is meant to be Cockney, Welsh, or something else he invented himself, but I imagine the problem wasn't helped much in the 2012 film The Dark Knight Rises, in which he spends most of the time mumbling behind a mask. Oh, did he play the guy? I'm gonna tear this plane apart. There's an insane scene with the helicopter and the plane, which is awesome i love that scene i'm not I, i'm not a big fan of like the at the marvel shit, as everyone knows but that dark knight with christian bale series that was pretty f-ing good wasn't it we can all say that, that was pretty f-ing good siri i'm hungry for a burrito i'm sorry bane i don't understand you Tom might be famous for his intense tough man and scary villain roles like the, 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 the mad max fury road piggy blinders and the revenant he was in the revenant but Graham Norton was keen to show a softer side to the hard man in rehearsals for his chat show when he whipped out a bit of archive footage from 1991. How the f old is Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy was 13? Is he really. Li- Tom was so 19. He- He's 10 years older than me. Jesus, that makes me feel better. I thought he was kind of my age. Wait, does it make me feel better? Not really. He just looks really good for being like 46. Jesus. Tom Hardy was only 13 when he made his live TV debut as one half of a musical act on The Big Big Talent Show starring Jonathan, hosted by Jonathan Ross. Jonathan Ross. Famous. This show was a forerunner to America's Got Talent and all the other international variations, but it was far gentler and more encouraging in tone. Mm. No wonder it's not as successful. People love negativity. There was no hint of withering criticism from the acid tongues of Simon Cowell and his buddies. Instead, the judging panel was made up of people like tap dancer Lionel Blair and actress Una Stubbs, who had always tried to find something positive to say about the roster of fresh young acts desperate to get their first big break. Sometimes people just need to be told, though, you're a bit sh**. But boy, this Lionel dude's like with his tap shoes. I've no idea who he is. But boy, they had their work cut out when a Tim Young Tom Hardy and his best buddy Ryan Griffiths wandered onto the stage under the name of the Rainbow Warriors. Styling themselves as slightly angry children with a strong environmental message, the duo were accompanied by a hip hop star backing track as they launched into their fierce self written rap attack called Mother Earth SOS. Oh, that sounds mega cringe, doesn't it? No wonder Tom Hardy was like, ah. Oh. Mm. My first TV appearance was an art attack, as I brought up like a thousand times because I don't know why. Because often this happens, and there'll be a reason to. It's not. It, it's not cringe. I'm just like a kid playing a kid. I was probably about 13 as well. I know we shouldn't be too cruel about teenage kids bravely stepping out into the light, out into the limelight for a good cause. But great jumping gobstoppers. This is really, really bad. <laughs> 
I love it. One of the funniest moments of the whole segment is the shocked open mouth of Judge Lionel Blair as he clearly struggles to absorb what exactly is being thrown in front of him. Please tell me. I realize I'm reading this one and I have no idea if it's... Danny could have made this up. Danny, if you've made this up, this is the most... I forgot we were playing a game. I forgot we were playing a game. Danny, if this isn't real, you've done an incredible job, mate, because this is so believable. Here's just a sample of the thought-provoking lyrics. From the bottom of the ocean and the top of the mountains. I can't rap. I'm going to stop. I'm just going to read it like it's a poem because that's what I'm more suited to. From the bottom of the ocean and from the top of the mountains high. Killer plastic milk bottles. Ecosystem running dry. No, no, no to mass pollution. Earth is screaming out. We've got to clean up this big mess we've made. So destroy the little lout. I think it's brilliant. I like it. I think it works great as poetry. That last line sounds a bit extreme for a Saturday evening family show. <laughs> destroy him! And it's like, are you calling for the death of people who litter? I mean, I kind of like, yeah, f yeah, f yeah, I'd call for that. People who graffiti. I was thinking it'd be a great idea. Like, they graffiti walls, right? How about we use that wall? There's a, uh, uh, on the street where I live, just I woke up the other morning and I wander outside and someone has spray painted a massive, f like, I don't know, tag or whatever you called it on the building opposite mine. And I'm like, that's f***ing horrible. <laughs> What the f is this piece of sh? And I just feel if they find the people who do that, they should just line them up against that wall. And I went to I went to Sarajevo years ago, and what they do there is where the, when there was the war and a bomb went off and killed someone, they filled the, the 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 holes which the bomb left with red cement, and it's just to remind people that people died there, so they fix everything and they just fill these like. Um, shrapnel holes or whatever with with red cement as like a memorial and i was thinking like when the when they catch the people who do the graffiti they bring them back to that place firing squad them and then the holes that are left in the wall afterwards where the graffiti was they paint over all the graffiti and just fill those holes with red cement to like be like yeah that's why i was if you can graffiti so don't do it <laughs> It's a bit much, I know, but it's a good plan, right? Uh, first with bombs and rockets destroying their homes, and then when they run helpless into the streets, uh, mowing them down with machine guns. Of course, Jonathan Ross and the three judges all had comforting words to say to the young duo at the close of the act, but Lionel Blair eventually composed himself enough to unconvincingly suggest that these boys could be the stars of the future. But the Rainbow Warriors were sadly not destined to make it through to the next round of the Big Big Talent Show. And in a brief closing consolatory interview with the pair, Jonathan Ross gets far more more out of Tom Hardy's mate Ryan Griffiths than he does out of Tom Hardy, who looks incredibly pissed off that they haven't won. There's probably that, like, competitive spirit is probably why he's f***ing Tom Hardy. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? London finalist Tom Hardy is a virile Virgo with dreamy, bluey-green eyes. There may be another reason why young Tom didn't look too happy, though. His mate Ryan cheerfully suggested Jonathan Ross that they need to work a bit harder on their act and that Tom messed up some of his lyrics. Kids throw him under the bus. No wonder Tom's got a face like a smacked ass. Over 30 years later, Tom Hardy clearly doesn't like to be reminded of his time in the Rainbow Warriors. As Graham Norton began to roll the archive footage during those 2020 chat show rehearsals, Tom simply stood up from the sofa and said, If we're going there, I'm gone. So what do you want to do? <laughs> Tom, just embrace it. Just be like, yeah, look, I'm a bit cringe. I was 13. It's okay. I feel... I look at videos a year ago and I'm like, oh my God, I was a bit cringe, wasn't I? And I'll look at this video in a year and be like, oh my God, I'm a bit cringe, aren't I? And uh, let's all just try to forget about that. <laughs> oh dear. Cringe. <laughs> At least that's what we think, he said. It's hard to tell with the accent. The segment was swiftly dropped, and Tom appeared to have cheered up a bit for the actual broadcast. You can't blame him, though. I still reckon he holds a grudge against that dickhead Ryan Griffiths for throwing me under the bus on live television. This is totally real, Danny. And if it's not real, I'm so impressed. Francis Ford Coppola once invented a t-shirt for itchy backs. No, he didn't. The American director, producer, and screenwriter Francis Ford Coppola is a funny little sausage. You'd think that by the time he hit the age of 66 in 2005, the five-time Oscar winner and revolutionary director of such classics as The Godfather and Bram Stoker's Dracula would have far more important things to do his time than file a patent for a new t-shirt which was intended to aid accurate back scratching. Now my back's itchy. I'm just like thinking about itching my back. No, he didn't. This is silly. I don't believe it, Danny. I already don't believe it. You've got a lot of uphill work to do on this. Although I do think the idea, like, if I retired, I'd like, I'd love the idea of just inventing shit. Like, just sitting down and just being like, you know, cool. Got some money. 
Got some time? Let's invent something. Just like sitting there. Just like trying to come up with an invention and then just like prototyping it. I think that'd be an absolute laugh. I'd love to do that. Just spending weeks, just trying to, weeks, years, whatever, just trying to invent something cool. <laughs> and most of it ended up with crazy stuff. But eventually, you'd be like, cool, invented something awesome. I don't know, that'd be a right laugh. Maybe I'll pack all this YouTube shit in and just become an inventor. Harry tells me you're quite the science whiz. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. I'm just kidding, I'm not smart enough for that. But that's exactly what he did. Of course, it's a common problem. You're suddenly struck by a dramatic itch on the very specific part of your back, which you can't reach yourself. So you ask a willing volunteer with good fingernails to conduct the scratching on your behalf. But the fact that you can't reach it yourself also means that you're struggling to even point to the exact location of your back in desperate need of relief. This leads to prolonged bouts of up a bit, no, down a bit, left a bit, no, to my left, no, you're going further away. Why? Well, I don't understand. Can people not reach their backs? I don't think there's a point on my back that I cannot reach. <laughs> like, no, I can reach all the parts of my back. I've never had this problem. Fear not, the director of Apocalypse Now has got this. In 2005, he filed a patent for an invention which would have the catchy name of Garment for Identifying Location on Body of the Garment Wearer. Um, yeah, it's a patent application, though. It's got to have a name like that, right? It can't be, you know, the cool name that you come up with later for marketing purposes. The back of the garment depicted a turtle. I'm not sure why he went with the turtle design of all things, but he slapped all the important stuff on the shell of the turtle, which is essentially a grid matrix with numbered regions. So the next time you get an itchy back and you have a friend's hands and you have a friendly hand standing by, you can bypass all that mucking about by simply shouting, Itchy spot on the back, grid reference P12. Jump to it, old bean. But you'd have to know where it is. You'd have to spend like a lot of time memorizing where it goes on your back and have that would require a great awareness of like where exactly the itch is. The whole point of like you you'd be like P12. Oh no 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 P11. Oh it's actually P10. That's how it would work. This is a stupid idea and I don't think it's real because I think it's just, I don't think this would be real if it was not invented by Francis Ford Coppola and the fact that it is invented by Francis Ford Coppola makes it even less believable. Unless the wearer of the garment memorized every single tiny grid reference on the back of the t-shirt beforehand, how would they know exactly what grid reference uh, to shout if they can't see it? Well, now I believe it a little bit more because Danny pointed out the flaw in his own thing. Hmm. I don't know. While Francis Ford Coppola isn't stupid, he had this covered too. His pattern suggests that the garment could be packaged with an accompanying card which replicates the turtle shell matrix for easy reference. Or even better, a miniature version of the matrix could be displayed at the bottom front of the garment, so the wearer simply has to lift up their shirt a little bit, take a quick glance at the matrix, and then shout the exact location, which needs a good long stretch. Yeah, I assume there would be, have to be some card that comes with it. The patent also goes on to explain that the garment could have a variety of other uses which delve beyond the back scratch. For example, you could take it to the tattoo parlor to point out the precise desired location of your tattoo of Margaret Thatcher. It could also be used to help. Or you, everyone's back is quite similar. You could just point to a picture of a back and be like, there. It's a back. It's, it's not like everyone has some sort of different layout for their back. <laughs> it's a back! It could be used to help guide masseurs into quickly hitting the right... Is that, is that the word for massage? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> I just realized I didn't know what the word for, like, plural of massage is. Massager? Masseuse! Help guide masseuses. Masseurs? Wouldn't it be masseuses? Masseurs. Oh, my God. Neither of them sound like English words, do they? They're both very weird. Masseuses. Masseurs. <laughs> into quickly, it sounds French. Um, like messes. Is messes that, is that actually British? Like messes so and so so and so? Like I remember when I was at school, it, it would be like if you got in trouble, you'd like the the housemaster would be like, and after reception, I need to speak to Messrs. Whistler, Hard Hardly, and whoever you know. That's how it would be. I think there was a kid called Hardly who got into a lot of trouble, which is why I haven't thought about that in like 30, 20 years. But like that name came to mind, and I realised there was a naughty kid called Hardly. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and I was also summoned on that list with uh, some amount of frequency. <laughs> Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. Or perhaps more specifically, the design could be used on hospital gowns to enable patients to quickly describe the location of a pain. I would have thought that Francis Ford Coppola might have emphasized this potential medical angle a bit more in his patents, but it gets no but it gets only a brief mention. The main focus of the entire patent is to offer a faster cure to an itchy back. The paid patent does stress that the matrix doesn't have to be made up of numbered grid references. It could be something a bit more fun, like symbols or pictures of zoo animals. But I'm not sure. This might just complicate things when you're caught in the wild throes of a back itch and need immediate assistance. Pain 
penguin, no giraffe, no hippo, hippo. What the f*** is this? Sadly, after investing all of that time into compiling a surprisingly comprehensive and detailed patent filing, Francis Ford Coppola appears to have lost all interest in it at some point, and the current stages of the patent is listed as abandoned. He might have realized that he could invest in a telescopic back scratcher and sort out his perpetual itching by himself. I have never realized that people can't itch their backs. What's going on? You're not a turtle. Like, he's got stuck on their back. Just itch your back. What, your arm's not flexible? I could, I'm pretty sure that I could reach all the way around to the other side of my body. It's not that hard. And even if you're like super fat, you can still, you could still do it. Is this an actual problem that people have? Just checking that my flies weren't down. Normally, <laughs> I stood up on front of the camera and be like, embarrassing my flies were down. <laughs> Still, whilst it may not have been one of Francis Ford Coppola's better ideas, I'm sure he put a lot more thought into this than he ever did The Godfather Part 3. Ah, never seen it. Stephen Fry is a criminal fraud. <laughs> I don't believe it. If I could choose five dream dinner guests, alive or dead, I think I'd probably choose Stephen Fry and four KFC employees, ideally alive. The latter would sort out the divine gourmet experience, while Stephen Fry would provide the equally divine sharp wit and sparkling anecdotes and fascinating pearls of wisdom. <laughs> This doesn't sound like a very good party for Stephen Fry. It's like, what's going to happen while well, Stephen, you're expected to show up for dinner and entertain me, Stephen. We're going to be eating KFC. <laughs> like, oh, that sounds like a hassle, Danny. Can't we just have a, can't we just chat like mates? And he's like, no, Stephen, you've got to bring the pearls of wisdom, Stephen. Come on. He's also probably minted, so I'm assuming it offered to foot the bill. <laughs> yes, Stephen Fry is, uh, he's probably wealthy. Actually, now that I think about it, I might replace one of the KFC employees with Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles, but never mind all of the details about, of this fiction fictitious dinner date right now. <laughs> the one thing I know about Stephen Fry, I mean, I know a few things about Stephen Fry. My brother-in-law was in uh, his husband's class at school. <laughs> it, just, it just says that Stephen Fry's husband's a lot younger than Stephen Fry because my brother-in-law is, I think, the same age as me. The point is that Stephen Fry is one of the very few people from the UK who genuinely deserves the title of national treasure. You might know him as a one half of the brilliant comedic duo Fry and Laurie, a regular face on Blackadder, and the original host of the long running puzzle panel quiz show QI, as well as the voice of the UK Harry Potter audiobooks, or a squillion other things besides. Why <laughs> the UK Harry Potter audiobooks? I know this. The American ones are read by someone else, which is a bit weird. <laughs> I mean, did you is it done in like an american accent you just prefer listening to that i mean judging by my analytics i know you americans like the british accent because like 60 percent of you watch these videos but much more I, I have many more american fans than i do british i personally regard him as one of the greatest writers of all time and find it a shame that he hasn't been asked to write a new novel for over 20 years although he's kept us entertained with a trilogy of engaging autobiographies i don't think i've ever read anything by stephen fry which is, I, I really should, because I think he's extremely funny and thoughtful. But you might have expected someone as intelligent and as wholesome and as logical as Stephen Fry to have breezed through school and Cambridge University on his journey to incredible fame and respect. I kind of feel if you're at Cambridge University, you probably did breeze through school because you got into Cambridge University. And then it might be more challenging at Cambridge University because, I don't know, you're an adult, you're away from home, you can misbehave a little bit. And uh, also now you're with, you might go to a school for like regular people. Now you're at Cambridge, everyone's smart. But in fact, he spent time in prison before he ever set foot in Cambridge. I don't believe you, Danny. <laughs> I feel like this is Stephen Fry. He's mega famous. I feel like I'd know if he went to prison. Although now I'm wondering, is that is there a story about him going to prison? I feel like this could be true. It turns into, but let's see what it was. Fraud? What did he defraud someone of? That seems like really serious. It's not like he went to prison for like protesting something that he believed in. It turns out that Stephen Fry was a bit of a wrong and in his youth, he was expelled from two different schools for bad behavior and sheer laziness. He got into Cambridge, and he made a bit of a mess of his A-levels at Norfolk College of Arts and Technology by not bothering to turn up for his exams. How the f*** did he get into Cambridge? You need, like, four A's to get into Cambridge. And most people only take three subjects! <laughs> In fact, it was shortly after that that a 17-year-old Stephen was going to run away from Norfolk and travel to Swindon, where he planned to sleep rough for a while. On his final day in Norfolk, he enjoyed an evening meal with his family, who were presumably under the impression that Stephen had turned up for his exams and were oblivious of his plans to scarper. Fully aware that he might get a bit cold sleeping rough for a while, Stephen somehow managed to make off with the luxurious coat of a family friend before bidding goodbye. But he later discovered that the stolen coat came packaged with a free bonus gift. There was a credit card stuffed in one of the pockets. Oh no, Stephen. <laughs> 
Don't use that, Stephen. At this point, he could have perhaps anonymously posted the credit card back to the family friends, but upon arriving at the mean streets of Swindon with no home to call his own, he decided he might as well forget about sleeping rough and instead embrace a new plan. <laughs> Hello, Four Seasons. <laughs> I'm just kidding, there's no Four Seasons in Swindon. It's Swindon. In Stephen's own words, I said to myself, what ho, and for the next three months, I went ape. The young Stephen Fry splashed out on swishy new clothes and treated himself to extended stays in the most expensive hotels in Swindon for those three months. A far cry from his original sleeping rough on the street strategy. <laughs> Holy sh**, did he actually? I kind of believe this now. I was like, no, no chance. But this seems like actually legit. I'm going to mark this one up as real so far. I remember reading a brilliant book that was so enthralling. It was kind of stupid, but I can't remember what it was called. It was about some kid. He must have been like 16. And he just like got mega into fraud. Just like <laughs> setting up credit cards in other people's names and just living this crazy life and like hanging out with celebrities. And it sounds so simple and like stupid, but I, th I think the guy was just a really good writer in the end. And it was just like mega entertaining book just about this guy who <laughs> just was like, it. <laughs> and I can't remember what happened to him probably prison. After checking into one particularly posh hotel called The Wiltshire, Stephen realized that his old shoes were looking a bit tatty. Is Swindon actually nice? I kind of made fun of Swindon because in my mind it's not very nice, but it, it, maybe it's nice. He cheerfully gave the porter a 50 pence tip and then trotted into town to buy a fancy new pair, pausing only to steal an Ingersoll watch from a local jewelry store along the way. Holy shit. Upon his return to the hotel, he found that there were other people in his room and we're not talking about chambermaids, it was the police. They'd been tipped off by the porter who had grown suspicious over why a young man with such apparent wealth had walked into the hotel with such tatty tramp shoes. Oh, crap. Am I going to get upbeat? The porter had contacted the credit card company and was informed that the credit card had been stolen. Things may have turned out differently if Stephen had dig, di dipped a bit deeper into his expansive pockets and given the porter a £1 tip instead of a measly 50p. Yeah, I feel like tipping coins is kind of... Uh, I always feel a bit... Unless you're leaving like a bunch of them on the table after a meal, I always feel a bit weird tipping coins. Is that okay? Can you tip coins? <laughs> Stephen was arrested and charged with credit card fraud, spending a few months in the charmingly named Puckle Church Prison, which was a remand prison for young offenders. During his period behind bars, his mother helped keep up his spirits by cutting out the crossword from the Times and posting it to him every single day. But when it came to trial, Stephen had something of a heavyweight batting on his side. His godfather happened to be a knighted QC. <laughs> Stephen, Cra Stephen, Stephen has that, you know. <laughs> He's got a proper family. That's intense. QC is Queen's Council, so like a very good barrister. And if he's been knighted, it means he's really f***ing good. Has noted that this was rather akin to bringing a battleship to a knife fight. <laughs> Although Stephen was found guilty of credit card fraud, he was immediately put on probation after the judge ruled that he'd already spent time in remand prison, and that was a sufficient custodial sentence. Very shortly afterwards, a reformed Stephen Fry returned to Norfolk to complete his studies and later booked his place at Cambridge University. How? <laughs> the rest is history. But Stephen later claimed that he wasn't too distressed by his time spent behind bars. After the experience of going through boarding school from the age of seven, he found Puckle Church Prison to be a breeze in comparison. Angelina Jolie once hired a hitman, but she was the hit. These all start off as unbelievable, and then I'm pretty much like, oh yeah, no, it sounds legit. Yeah, okay. We don't want to dwell too much on the troubled early life of Angelina Jolie, but by the, uh, by the age of 22, when she was still struggling with her career, she admits that she was feeling suicidal and had experimented with just about every drug on the market. The good news is that we know she came through this traumatic period and went on to become one of the most famous award-winning actresses and humanitarians uh, on the planet. But turning back briefly to those troubled days of darker thoughts, it has to be said that Angelina made a very peculiar decision on how she was going to end it all in the 1990s. She hired a genuine hitman to track her down and kill her. How the f*** would she know how to hire a hitman? Like, if someone was like, if I was like, oh, I need to get a hitman, I'd be like, okay. I think my first thought would be like, buy a VPN with cash somehow, buy a computer that is not my computer, and then go use the Wi-Fi at some other town that is not where I live. Because I've done enough casual criminalists to know that they will catch you. <laughs> Or maybe they won't, because Cash Criminalist is about all the people who got caught. All the ones that didn't. Well, they just got away with it, didn't they? And there's more of them. <laughs> but maybe there's not. For murder, maybe there's not. What's the stats on that? I think most murders are solved. It's like 60% or something on all, isn't it? But most of them are just like, yeah, did you kill your wife again? <laughs> it's always the husband.
I'm not sure exactly where you find a highly recommended hitman, as I don't think they're usually allowed to advertise in the local newspapers. But Angelina, if I, if movies are anything, it's just you go, you, you know, back in the day in the 90s, you just go down there, you pick up the Gazette or whatever, you turn to the back and you look in the W section for wet work. <laughs> Angelina reckons that they're not particularly hard to find in New York, and the initial discussion was very professional and businesslike. Angelina had agreed for the hitman to take from her account over a period of time so that the transaction didn't look too dodgy after the event. But why would she go down such an unusual route? It was apparently try to avoid any of her family members feeling guilty or responsible for her death. If Angelina had taken her own life, her family and friends may have felt as if they could have done more to help prevent the personal tragedy. But such an emotional burden would be lifted if she instead had been the victim of a random murder. Oddly enough, I believe this. I totally believe this. Oddly enough, it was the hitman who did himself out of a job by talking Angelina out of it. He asked the future Tomb Raider star to think about it for a couple of months before fully committing to the hit. And within those crucial couple of months, Angelina experienced a few positive changes in her life which convinced her to stick it out and rethink her deadly business proposition. What a surprisingly considerate hitman. Good job she remembered to call him back within the cancellation window, though. I believe this. I don't know why. It's so short and kind of feels like a non-believable one, but it's so random that I believe it. I believe it. Alice Cooper almost became a monk. It's probably fairly common knowledge that despite his well-deserved moniker as the godfather of shock rock, the raspy-throated musician with a taste for hard rock, heavy music, and theatrical performances involving fake blood, reptiles, and electric chairs is a bit of a pussycat. Is Alice Cooper the guy who bites heads off animals? I don't really know his music. I'm sure I do. Like if I listen to it on Spotify, I'd be like, oh, I know that song, I know that song, but I couldn't name an Alice Cooper song right now. Alice Cooper would clearly much rather pop down the golf course for the afternoon than sell your daughter's soul to Satan, and whilst he battled his own addictions to alcohol and cocaine in the 1970s and early 80s, he spent the vast majority of a long career, now spanning 60 years, as a surprisingly clean living soul. He's the kind of chap who's far more likely to offer you a free counseling session and a pep talk than a bag of weed and a couple of pills. But Alice Cooper's early life reveals quite a staggering origin story for a future heavy metal god with a penchant for dramatic horror. He was born Vincent Damon Fernier in 1948. Alice Cooper was originally the name of his rock band that he formed in 1964 before he adopted the name himself for his subsequent solo career in 1975. Vincent's parents were strict Christians, and the young Alice Cooper spent much of his ch childhood in churches and Sunday school. That might not have left a lot of room for much social activity, but Vincent was hardly the most popular boy in class anyway. In fact, he was the teacher's pet who would happily grass up his friends to keep in the teacher's good books. Oh, Alice. Oh, Vincent. An unofficial biography of Alice Cooper, released in 1996, reveals the true feelings of a whole bunch of kids who are unfortunate enough to share a classroom with Vincent in Cortez High School in Phoenix, Arizona. One of them tweet reveals, He was a whiny goody two-shoes. You couldn't do anything in front of Vincent because you know he would snitch on you at the first opportunity. He seemed resistant to the idea of having fun and just being a teenager. When we reached the end of school, we had him down as the kid who was most likely to become a tax inspector with a hard-on for his job. <clears throat> when I first saw him on TV a few years later, I could have believed this was the same little douchebag that I used to know at school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no wonder this was the unofficial biography because goddamn. <laughs> Vincent may not have pursued a career as a tax inspector with a hard on, but he very nearly became a monk instead after school was deemed to be out forever. Oh, now I know an Alice Cooper song. Schools, schools out forever. Something like that, right? <laughs> Excuse me, what are you doing? In the early 1960s, he became a novice religious brother at St. Anthony's Orthodox Monastery in the Sonoran Desert, Arizona. His daily schedule involved prayer, breakfast, prayer, a bit of gardening, prayer, vine dressing, prayer, preparing food, prayer, a spot of woodwork, prayer. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, school's out forever. Vincent's ultimate plan was to dedicate the rest of his life to strict vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But after just a little under six months, he had a sudden change of heart and re returned home, informing the band Alice Cooper just one year later. <laughs> yes, it turns out being a monk is kid boring and there's no drugs at all could it be that a young vincent had seen the light during his time in the monastery and realized that he was destined instead to worship at the temple of heavy metal well no not really he admits today that the only reason he packed it all in was because he was really missing his mum and dad it's a bit of a drag isn't it you know what's interesting i'm beginning to think that all of these are real i think danny's playing with me a little bit the only one i didn't was the bruce willis stuff take the will smith one and I don't know if I believe the Alice Cooper one, but I'm beginning to think that, okay, no, I don't believe the Alice Cooper one. And I don't believe the Bruce Willis one. Oh, for f sake, it's because it says Willis on my thing, even though it's Will S, Will Smith. I don't believe that. 
I'm not going for they're all true, even though I'm kind of tempted to. Bully Idol's three-week hotel room party. I've never quite understood why some rock stars tend to be, get a bit carried away with the idea of trashing their hotel rooms. I can't say I've ever been gripped by such an urge myself. Just before check I tend to make the bed tidy around a bit and try to waft the smell of midnight kebab out of the window. I don't know why I also make the bed before I leave a hotel room. I'm like, I don't want people to think I'm a slob. <laughs> So I always like just tuck it up. I throw my trash in the bin and then I take the card down to reception. <laughs> I never just like leave the room a mess and just wander out the hotel. I'm always like, check it out. And they're like, did you have anything from the minibar? Nope. Did you pay for the room? Yes. <laughs> and they're like, why are you here? And I'm like, I don't know. It's polite. I'm leaving. I wanted to say goodbye. I'm sorry. No! I've never really felt compelled to smash the mirror to bits, piss in the kettle, throw a TV set out of the window, or crash a stolen motorbike into the bathroom. I don't think I've ever dared to leave a slightly damp towel on the floor. Oh my god, though. <laughs> I put the towels in the bath like a normal person. But I stayed in a hotel a few months ago. And I was so sick. I had like some terrible flu that just came on suddenly. It was like some 24, 48 hour flu. And I was so sweaty. I was so sweaty in the night. I woke up in the night. That bed was soaking wet. Like, and in the morning, it was, I just was sweating like a beast. No covers. Just because I was just, I couldn't not. I was just sweating like an absolute beast. And that bed was soaked. It was like I had pissed in it. It was that wet. I, my clothes were soaked. The bed was soaked. And I didn't know what to do. I was just like, okay, I'm just going to, like, check out late and try and let it air out. And it was still damp. It was really bad. I was so sweaty. I was so thirsty. <laughs> it's crazy. You're afraid to get wet. But for a certain breed of musician, trashing your hotel room after a wild party is considered to be some kind of ceremonial ritual on the path to becoming a truly credible rock star. And few people party harder than Billy Idol, who once went on a three-week hotel room bender, which only ended after the Thai army had been called in to shoot- What? Oh, wait! There was a part of the title that I obviously missed, because I was reading the Alice Cooper entry, and then it was like, okay after the Thai army had been called into shooting with a tranquilizer dart. I'm not sure if Simon will be entirely familiar with Billy Idol. I've heard of him. The British-American spiky-eared musician with a permanent fierce snarling lip started out as a punk in the late 70s outfit Generation X before going solo and striking international success over the next couple of decades with a slicker mainstream sound. Best known for his 80s hits such as White Wedding and Rebel Yell is this It's a nice day for a white wedding. I know this. Isn't this on the Grand Theft Auto Vice City sound? Track. Billy's music may have mellowed slightly over the years, but he remained a punk at heart and spent much of his most successful period completely off his tits on a conveyor belt of cocktail on a conveyor belt cocktail of hard drugs. When he first showed up in Bangkok, Thailand in 1989 for a holiday, the idea was to actually take a bit of a break from the drug consumption and just focus instead on the drink and the prostitutes. <laughs> One thing at a time, Billy! And maybe a bit of sandcastle construction on the beach if he and his buddies had time. Bangkok is not by the beach. But they grew very quickly bored of all of that, and things went downhill after they tried to buy some cocaine from a taxi driver who actually sold them a vial of the strongest heroin in town, which proved to be a bit of a catalyst for the three-week hotel bender. <laughs> oh, sh**. And you don't want to buy drugs in Thailand. They'll put you in prison in the horrible Bangkok prison. Quan Chin Bong or something. Or like, it's called the, the Bangkok Hilton is the nickname. It's horrible. I made a video about it. You don't want to go there. <laughs> it didn't ta all take place in the same hotel. Billy's trail of destruction started off in the presidential suite of the Oriental Hotel before he eventually got forcibly ejected from the premises after initially refusing to vacate the suite for the incoming president of Cambodia. It's the presidential suite! Get out, Billy! His party then moved to a room in the Rawcliffe Hotel in Pattaya, pa pa Pattaya for the second week, during which time, amongst many other things, he got hold of a five-foot log and threw it straight at a set of sliding glass doors, shattering them into tiny pieces. Log. Boy, oh boy. The hotel staff initially considered calling the police, but were instead happy to charge Billy $20,000 for all the damage that he'd caused in the space of a busy week and then threw him out. For Billy's final week in lovely Thailand, he returned to Bangkok, where he booked a suite at the Mandarin Oriental. I've been there. I've been to the Mandarin Oriental in Bangkok. It's nice. By the end of the week, the hotel staff were getting a little fed up with the endless line of prostitutes flowing in and out of the lobby of their prestigious... Yeah, it's really nice. Hose, Dave, Dave Ho. <laughs> Good evening, bitches. It's the same. And I know, like, Billy Idol's super rich, but they've still got to, like, keep up uh, an image for all of the other guests who are also rich because it's the Mandarin Oriental. 
But they were even more concerned by the fact that Billy and his drug-fueled mates had spent most of the week smashing up all the appliances and demolishing the furniture. The problem intensified when Billy Point Bank refused to leave the hotel as he was having too much of a good time. He also refused to pay the $150,000 in room fees and damages that he'd racked up during his pleasant stay. That is a lot of money back in the day. That's an extraordinary amount of money today. In the in the end, the hotel staff enlisted the services of the Thai army, who came swarming onto the scene, shot Billy Idol with a tranquilizer dart, and carried him off the, to a hotel. The, carried him out of the hotel on a stretcher. He later mirthfully reflected that he was very lucky, as he couldn't have ended up in a Thai prison. Yeah, he could have. But I still don't understand why so many rock stars turn so willingly destructive when faced with the innocence of a hotel room. It's it's just because that's the thing, right? They're all trying to one up each other, and now Billy Idol has won up to all of them. You never saw this kind of behavior from Cliff Richard or The Shadows or Alice Cooper. The answers. Okay, here we go. Um, I think that one was real. Did Will Smith get a tattoo that looked like Margaret Thatcher? I think this one's fake. This opening story is false. Boom! Will Smith has no tattoos at all. The supposed tattoo artist Martin Hildebrandt was actually the first documented professional tattoo artist in the US, opening what was probably the first American tattoo studio in the 1870s. Okay. Did Tim Allen snitch on his fellow cocaine dealers to escape a life sentence? Ah, oh, this one we both get zero points. So, so far it's one for me and zero for Danny. Let's just put me, Danny. One for me. And we both get zero for this next one because I know it's true. In 1997, he was stopped at Bloomfield Hill, Michigan, after being stopped, spotted driving erratically in his Ferrari and clocking up speeds of 70 miles per hour in a 40 mile per hour zone. His blood alcohol was found to be nearly double the legal limit in Michigan. Tim Allen's father had been a tragic victim of drunk driving when Tim was 11 years old after a collision with the driver who was way over the limit. Tim escaped jail time after being found guilty of driving under the influence, not by snitching on all the storekeepers who had ever served him with alcohol, but by agreeing to check into rehab as one of the conditions of his release. Uh, one year probation. He apparently hasn't touched a drop since. Wait, what? Oh, okay, so this was as well. I was like, wait, was this instead of? But it obviously says as well then. So that is zero. Uh, was Christopher Walken a former lion tamer? I said yes to this one. Yes, Christopher Walken did really work as an assistant lion tamer at the age of 16. Another interesting true fact about Christopher Walken is that he was very nearly chosen to play Han Solo in the Star Wars franchise. That was the Indiana Jones guy, right? Played him instead. George Lucas was hesitant about using Harrison Ford again so soon after it appeared in George's previous film, American Graffiti. Even after Harrison Ford had been cast, George was seriously considering changing his mind and giving the role to Christopher Walken. Not that Christopher gives a shit now. He says, I'm very glad Harrison Ford got it. I would have been terrible. So that's another one for me, Danny. Did Michelle Pfeiffer get mixed up in a lethal cult? Zero for this one because I know it's true. If it's false, then you get a point, Danny, for free. This is true. And sadly, the concept of breatharianism is still feebly limping on today. One of the most famous modern practitioners is an Australian who likes to be known by the name of Jasmaheen rather than her real name of Ellen Grieve. Jasmaheen has held various expensive breatharian workshops and retreats and has lectured around the world on the spiritual benefits of not eating food or drinking water. However, much like her predecessor Wiley Brooks, it seems that she's been caught out not always practicing what she preaches. Yes, she has. A journalist from the UK observed in an airport that Jasmine had ordered an onboard meal for her long flight, but Jasmine pointed out that she wouldn't actually be eating it. She just, she just gives it a smell and then throws it away. And when Jasmine agreed to be filmed by an Australian TV show for a proposed 10-day study which would demonstrate her devotion to her non-diet, the supposed guru of breatharianism began to fall seriously ill after four days, and filming had to be halted in fear that she wouldn't reach the end of it. Shocking, we know. She can't survive without food or water. <laughs> Five deaths have been directly linked to breatharianism and Jasmine's guidance books, but she has denied any responsibility. That's uh, zero, zero. That's another no points for anyone because I knew it was real. Was Tom Hardy's first excruciating TV appearance on a talent show? This Was this the one that I said yes to? And it was so unbelievably good that if this is false, I'll be so impressed. This one is false. Danny, that is fucking cracking, to be honest. That is so good. Tom Hardy was never a member of the Rainbow Warriors. One of Tom's earliest TV appearances was, in fact, on a 1998 edition of The Brig Breakfast, when the then 21-year-old won a Find Me a Supermodel competition and landed the prize of a modeling contract. One year later, he did very briefly form a rap duo under the name Tommy No. 1 and Eddie Too Tall, who recorded a recently uncovered track called Falling on Your Ass. But I suggest it wasn't as good as the entirely fictitious Mother Earth SOS by the Rainbow Warriors. <laughs> by the way, if you take the first line of each of the lyrics I quoted from Mother Earth SOS, it spells out fake news. 
<laughs> Danny, did you use ChatGPT to write it? Because it was quite good. Uh, Danny, that's one for you. I would almost be tempted to give you two points for that one. Absolutely brilliant. Did Francis Ford Coppola once invent a t-shirt for itchy backs? I said no to this one. He most certainly did. What the f***? <laughs> okay, another one for you, Danny. Two, two. It's good to know that Francis Ford Coppola may have turned his hand to product in innovation if the movie, if his movie directing career hadn't worked out. It very nearly didn't. When Paramount Pictures greenlit the original Godfather movie in 1972, Francis Ford Coppola was way down the list of preferred directors, but everyone else turned it down. Throughout the shooting of the movie that would put Coppola on the map, he was continually threatened with the sack as Paramount felt that he was turning their proposed cool gangster movie into a lifeless drama with too many talky bits. I've never seen The Godfather. I like movies with talky bits, though. Maybe I should see this. this is, I don't really like gangster movies. That's the thing. Like, Usual Suspects, I enjoyed. But what's that other one? There's another famous one, Goodfellas. Didn't really like Goodfellas. Everyone's like, that's a great gangster movie. And it made me realize I don't really like gangster movies. That's why I've never really seen The Godfather. But if it's got lots of talky bits then I'm probably going to be into it, because I like dramas. The situation got so bad that stand-in directors were hanging about on the set, waiting for an instruction from above that thankfully never came. It's one for you, Danny. Is Stephen Fry a criminal fraud? I said true to this one. This story is absolutely true. That's another point for me. Uh, as Stephen Fry himself has recalled in detail in the first volume of his autobiography, published in 1997, one of Stephen's later flirtations with the law ended with more positive consequences. During an interview on the Irish television show The Meaning of Life with Gay Byrne, Stephen Stephen Fry was asked what he would say to God if he ever arrived in heaven. Stephen's response was brutal. He would apparently ask God, Bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? Because the God who created this universe, if it were created by God, is clearly a maniac, an utter maniac, totally selfish. We have to spend our lives on our knees thanking him. What kind of God would do that? I think I've heard of this, but he deserves a round of applause for that f***ing legendary outburst. One viewer took exception to this and complained to the police. Oh, this is Ireland. They get serious about this, right? Or the guard eye, as we're in Ireland. The viewer expressed concern that Stephen's words violated Ireland's Defamation Act in 2009, which clearly states that anyone who's blasphemous material is guilty of an offence which could lead to a fine of €25,000. <laughs> guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Stephen Fry doesn't give a shit. Could lead to a fine of €25,000? If I were Stephen Fry... I'd be like, cool. Who do I make the check out to? <laughs> Just be like, what's the maximum fine? 25,000? Cool. Yeah, I don't regret what I said. Here's 25,000 euros. Have a nice day. <laughs> it's like uh, Sir Patrick Stewart. When, do you remember when the ice bucket challenge was around? And it was like you had to dump the ice bucket over your head or make like 500 pounds donation to whatever charity. And he's just someone challenges him. And it's just a video of him writing a check. And it's like... Mwah! Although an investigation was conducted by the guard, it was swiftly dropped on the grounds that not enough people were offended by Stephen's remarks. Thankfully, nobody has ever been prosecuted for blasphemy under this defamation act. In fact, the subsequent press coverage relating to the case may have helped inspire the later Irish referendum on abolishing this blasphemy law in 2017, in which nearly 65% of voters elected to get rid of it. It was introduced in 2009. That's, it seems like a law that you'd have in the 17th king century, along with like insulting the king. Stephen later stated that he felt proud to have played a small part in the this decision. Incidentally, Stephen Fry also claims to have snorted cocaine in Buckingham Palace, the BBC television centre, the House of Commons, and the House of Lords. F***ing legend. Angelina Jolie hired a hitman for herself. I believe this one was true. It's currently 3-2. This one is true, and now it is 4-2, Danny. Oh, sh**. I'm not sure what happened to the hitman, but I'd like to think that he embraced a new career path and trained to become a counsellor. Did Alice Cooper almost become a monk? I said this one was false, right? I don't think Alice Cooper became a monk. This one is false, Alice Cooper. Boom, Danny. Is that 5-2? It's 5-2, son. Mmm, yes! Ah, uh, but was never an annoying school snitch, and he never trained to become a monk. He did spend a lot of time in church as a kid, though, and he's a born-again Christian today. Did Billy Idol's three-week Taurine party end in a tranquilizer dart? I said yes to this, and I do. I'm so sure with this one. But Danny, you told such a good story with the Tom Hardy one that I could believe now that this is false, even though I still think it's true. Is it going to be, it's 5-2 now, 
And now it is 6-2, Danny. Mm. In fact, Billy Idol has led something of a charms life, and it's quite amazing that he's still alive after all of his drug overdoses and near-fatal accidents, although he apparently leads a far more sensible lifestyle today as he hurtles towards the age of 70. One of his most famous near misses occurred just one year after, he, after the extended Thailand hotel party when he ran a stop sign on his Harley Davidson in Los Angeles and collided with a car. He very nearly died, and the accident almost cost him a leg. It may also may have cost him the role of the baddie shape-shifting android assassin T-1000 in the Terminator 2 Judgment Day movie. What? Billy Idol had been James Cameron's first choice for the role, but those plans were scrapped after the accident. Hasta la vista, Billy. Billy Idol should have followed in the footsteps of Goody Two Shoes Alice Cooper, and who, who claims to have never trashed a hotel room in his life, although admittedly he made this claim while getting paid loads of money to promote Crown Plaza hotels and resorts. So it wouldn't have been great to confess that he enjoys setting fire to the shower curtains while snorting cocaine from the toilet lid. I mean, come on, this is not Buckingham Palace. 627272, Danny. Mm, yes! Thank you for watching. How did you do? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Christopher Walken, he's the guy. I, I know his face, right? He's Detective, whatever his name is, from American Psycho, and a, a whole lot of other where he had bigger roles. I don't know. <laughs>